Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Morning Coffee. Coffee with Kristen. Oh, that's nice. Coffee with a K. Yeah. <laughs> um, or Mornings with the Misses. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's nice. Welcome to Coffee with Kristen. I'm Kristen. Hi. I'm Marcus. Or Morning with the Misses. I'm the Mister. I like it. <laughs> um, okay, so today's topic is. Hold on, I'll say it in a different way. Good morning. I'm Mr. Homemaker, and this is Coffee with the Misses. I said it back. <laughs> do it. Morning with the Misses. Do it again, do it again. Good morning. I'm Mr. Homemaker, and this is Mornings with the Misses. We only had to do that three times. <laughs> So happy to be here, Marcus. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, so it's like 5 a.m. This is what we do with our mornings. Um, this morning, I wanted to talk about a topic that I feel is gaining a lot of traction. I feel like on like a lot of podcasts I'm listening to, other parents I'm talking with, the concept of invisible labor. And comes as no surprise to you, I have thoughts on this. So, so do you think that you could describe what invisible labor is and why people are talking about it? <laughs> I feel like you should introduce why people are talking about it. I mean, we've discussed a little bit before how running a household, although this would apply elsewhere, but running a household involves a lot of constant, um, planning and preparation and troubleshooting and like triaging as right. things emerge right. but also there's some routine things which is where we focused in the past of like every week we need to go to the grocery store how are we going to figure out what are we going to eat this week and right you know who needs what in their lunches and all that stuff and so all of the like um identifying needs right and determining how we will meet those needs is invisible work that's being done in somebody's head. Right. It is less obvious, visible, tangible than like the actual cooking the meal. Right. I think it's so important and I think it's a very real thing and I think it's a very real thing that, at least from my perspective, I think tends to fall on moms for a number of reasons and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I have a very vivid memory of like, I didn't know what it was called at the time, but it was this exact topic where, um, when you were like our before life, when we were both working crazy hours, you were working out of the yeah. house and like, and I think it actually may have even been when we were both going into the office all the time, like back before COVID. Yeah. And there was a moment at which I was like, I just don't. I can't carry this all in my head anymore. Like I don't yeah. have the decision. I, I I don't have any more decision space in my head to be able to think through these things. And I couldn't characterize it. And I feel like now that people have been talking about this invisible labor, especially as I'm seeing dads on Instagram, like there's this one dad that talks a lot about it and like, Hey, like recognize, like, don't just step up to do the task, but recognize all the things that come with that. But I think there's actually a lot more complexity than people are recognizing there. I'm in that. interested to hear more about what complexity you think there is. Sure. Yeah. So um, I think the, you know, so, so people are basically saying like, hey, dads, step up. You can't just like swoop in and make the meal. Like that's nice, but that's not taking over the burden of like the entire burden of an activity. And so I think that a couple of things kind of come in here, right? Like one is, um, I think that unless you figure out a way in your household to, to, um, share that experience, it's yeah. going to be really hard for your partner, regardless of who does the thing to be able to even understand what the invisible labor means. Right. Right. So like, when we first started and you became stay at home, like the first, ex one of the first weeks of our experiment of like, can we do this was like, you f kind of followed me and had me do the thing that I was doing. Yeah. I think that what was really great about that was that you asked to do that because it would be super awkward for me to be like, you want to do the meal? Let's, why don't you follow me for a week? Like yeah. that's like incredibly condescending. So the fact that you were like, let me see how you do it. 
yeah. was really helpful. And we like walked step by step. We're like, how do you do the kids' laundry? Like, what laundry detergent do you use? Et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the first thing was like figuring out a process by which like right. you well, because, can really. Yes. And so one, uh, just to add on to that before we move on. Two things that drove me to that is I realized in the lead up to like me going on sabbatical and us like starting the yeah. experimental phase is you and I had had several conversations about who was doing what and why I wasn't doing certain things. Yeah. And it sort of came to the surface that like a lot of it was, and I think we, we caught some audio of us discussing this when it came to like laundry. So I'm like, I am so paralyzed by, it, I have no idea how your system works or like what the state of the system is. Right. And I was just like, because particularly when I was just away from the house for the vast majority of the day, I come home and they're like, are clothes in places. Right. And it is not always entirely clear. Like, is this clean but not yet folded or is this dirty? Right. Well, like, you know, the right. different things like that. Because it was all, it was in my head, right? Like, yeah. I would know, like, okay, well, the pink laundry basket today is full of clean laundry right. because I've got to fold it, but I didn't have time because we were crazy busy. And so... And so we had sort of, like, brought to the surface through conversation that, like, there were just a bunch of gaps in, like, my understanding of what was in your head. Right. And, like, I only slowly did I gain a, a recognition of, like, those known unknowns. And only slowly, I think, did you gain a realization that like, oh, like it's not possible for me to know what is in your head. Right. And so like it, I, my ability to jump in was curtailed by like that information was not available to me. Right. Um, but then the second thing is, and again, like this is an extreme solution. I mean, not extreme, like irrational, but extreme, like there would be other techniques I can, I would, I would imagine, but I thought it would be the most clean and like sort of scientific to say right. like, let's eliminate the variables of miscommunication in a, in a way and just say, let's say laundry. I'm just going to do all the laundry this week or, or this month mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't want you to do any laundry because that's the only way that I will know for sure. I understand the whole system mm -hmm. and not some things are continuing to be a mystery to me and I just don't know. I don't know them. Right. So anyway, so that's how we early a year ago like started to really deliberately say let's break ourselves out of our right. our like sort of frames um like very consciously and deliberately and in that sort of all to all the way to the other extreme right. at least on a trial basis kind of thing and i think like so one of the things that i recognized now that we've kind of that that we've done that and we are doing that is is the um how difficult the limited knowledge is. So for instance, like I feel like wives, we can tend to be like, like I remember having this conversation with other moms. Oh my God, my husband, not you. <laughs> oh my God, my husband is such an idiot. How does he not know like what to feed our kid for snack? Like I do this all the time. Until I was the one that was working and you had been, and I had not packed his lunch and you were the one that did the lunch and it was time for afternoon snack. And I, I realized I had to ask you like, what, like, what do you think I should feed him? Like, has he had seven squeezy packs today? Did right. he already eat an apple and an well, orange? That, that's the thing we routinely do. Right. But like, like we're trying to not over index on certain foods that like we know he likes. Right. We're trying to introduce different foods. And right. If you haven't been the one involved up to that point in the day. Right. You're coming in like, wait, where are where are we yeah. in what he's eating and not eating? And so like you realized as you had to ask that question, like, oh, right. the reverse is also true. If I'm the one feeding him all day, you're going to have to ask right. me. Or like the laundry, I'm like yeah. going upstairs and like smelling the laundry. Like, is this clean? Because like it's not in the dryer anymore, which means we've definitely done an extra load. And so I think that that's kind of one thing is just like being open on both sides to recognizing like the invisible labor that your partner is doing, but that also that when you are the person doing that stuff, your partner is at a dis as at a it as a is at a knowledge disadvantage and like it's not because they're they're idiots or they d don't want to be involved so it's like that's not the thing they're doing and so i think that that's like one pitfall that i think you got to be really careful with and and uh, sometimes i think people think this is like actually i had a conversation like this recently where i was trying you're describing a phenomenon like this and somebody's reaction was like yes i i am very familiar with this character flaw in my husband and i was like whoa 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 right this is not a character flaw this is like the human condition Right. This is a universal problem that people suffer from. Just it, you can learn to overcome it, but this is a 
like on one of those like lists of cognitive biases that like affect people subconsciously is the curse of knowledge, which is just Googled. And so like according to Wikipedia, that is it occurs when an individual who's communicating with another individual unwittingly, right, like subconsciously assumes that the other individual has the same background knowledge and understands the context. Right. In which I'm trying to communicate. Right. Like you just, you bake in like, because you're saying what you think you need to say in the context you already have. And you're taking for granted that you also share that context. Right. But the other person does not, rarely has the same context you do. Right. And so if you're not deliberately saying, let me make sure you understand where we're at. Now yeah. let me tell you what I think we should do next. If you just say, I think we should do this next. It's like, what are you talking about? Right. I have no framework in which to process this. I mean, I, so like you and I have both... Like, this is a thing that affects all people. This is a thing that we struggle with. Yeah. And this is a good example of how that can become, like, it's a it's a very small pebble in the, like, the gears of, like, healthy communication in a marriage right. that, like, really grinds your gears. Right. If you're not like, oh, we should really get on the same page about this. Yeah. yeah. And not just on the same page, like, so, and so just, like, so other examples, right, of, like, where there, because I think the food thing comes up a lot, but, like, where there could be invisible work is, like, um, what, like, well, both meal planning and, like, lunch packing and that kind of, that whole, like, like, feeding of the family is one thing. Yeah. There's also, the you know, the schedule, the schedule. And logistics. Um, there's also, like, tangible things, like, planning for birthday parties and or like a travel like travel and a trip like all of the things that go into like who researched where you're going and looked at kid friendly at like activities that you were going to be able to do and thought about what needed to be packed and the person who actually packed it and who's like how you're getting to the airport and like all of the things that happen that are part of that a lot of that is like research or planning that has gone on like behind behind the scenes and it takes up a lot of like mental space, mental space and planning. Now, the flip side of this is, so say you have a partner who is awesome and steps up and says like, yeah, like I want to take this on, right? Hypothetically. Hypothetically. <laughs> I, might, I feel like hair, maybe it's like one hair and it's like driving me nuts and I keep doing this. <laughs> I can't figure it out. So hypothetically, um, you have a partner who wants to step up. Now, moms, this is where I think we completely fail our partners, which is if you are going, if you are telling your husband, I need help, I need you to take on this thing, then you need to let them take on that thing. This is not an opportunity now to criticize the way in which your partner is doing this thing. If you're asking your partner to take on meals and meal planning, you have to let it go and you cannot constantly question what your partner's doing. I think like that is that is a recipe for disaster. Your husband wasn't like questioning you and how you did meal planning or laundry or whatever. So, but I think in order to prepare for that and in yeah. order to kind of transition that, you have to have a conversation about what you value in that thing. What yeah. do you each value? So it, again, let's go to the meal planning example. One of the things that um, I found is moms are like, yeah, but if I let my husband do the meal planning, it's just going to be mac and cheese and hot dogs all the time. And I think like stereotypically like, yeah, like I remember my dad growing up when my dad was in charge of dinner because my mom worked at a hospital. So she worked late nights, like a couple nights a week. We like loved it. My dad was like, it was like pancake dinner. It was yeah. like mac and cheese and ham you know, and hamburgers. Like my dad had a small repertoire of things he cooked. Um, but so, so when you're starting that conversation, start to talk about if, like, I know one thing for that's important for a lot of moms, myself included, is like nutrition, right? Like the nutritional value and a balanced meal and making sure we're getting enough, you know, vegetables and greens in our diet. But like, you need to talk about that with your husband and talk about like what that looks like to you, right? Like, but also being willing to let go a little bit because like, if your kids have mac and cheese someday, like and they don't get a green, it's okay. And I think that a lot of times, like, and by the way, you as the mom used to make those choices sometimes and you didn't like have anybody questioning you, right? Like you, had a, you had a fast night, the kids came home late from soccer or whatever, and you're like, okay, we're just doing pizza. But you're gonna, there's, there's a, I think a lot of times where moms would be like, well, of course he went and got pizza. Like, it's like, but you had that decision space. So yeah. making sure that you're like having those conversations of like, 
what does it what does it ideally look like and coming to agreement on so how are we going to execute this like right what would be some what is what is ideal and how can we try to carry that out and and have it be balanced on a day-to-day -day basis but then also like understanding the underlying reasons that that might be so one example that I heard the other day was a, a guy like a woman was working late and her husband was making dinner and so she called to check in it was like for their toddler and she's like oh so like so uh, what did you end up making for dinner and he tells her and she's like so no protein and the guy like fly, like gets really angry right like here he is like right. trying his best to do what he was gonna mm -hmm. do she swoops, swoops and in she and swoops like critiques and, him right yeah. and I think and I get that and so the advice that the the podcaster was giving or the guest was like well, um, you know, like you try to like in the moment, like to diffuse this. And I think it's cause he probably work, works more with men, but he was like, you know, try to say like, well, so it sounds like having protein in the meal is important to you. Like you're saying the, the host or the sort of advisor to this dad was advising the dad, not the mom mm -hmm. and saying when you're, when your wife reacts this way, yeah. here's how you can diffuse that. Right. As, so this was not advice for the woman. Right. Um, I think it's dumb. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's consistent with the typical advice you hear of like, like in order to, right, right, to let me jump to the punchline. I think it's dumb too, <laughs> but I want to defend it a little bit, which is, um, you want to not react emotionally and defensively before you even really like make sure you understand that's what the person's saying, right? So if nothing else, you want to like maintain composure long enough to be like, one, did I understand what you're trying to communicate to me effectively? <laughs> and then like two, like, do you realize like that you're coming off real rude? Do you want to try that again? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I say, sometimes I say stuff like that. You don't like it when I yeah. say stuff like that. But I think it's a better alternative to like, this conversation's over and I'm just furious. Yeah. And so like trying to diffuse, like, do I really understand you? And do you realize how you're coming off? Right. Like let's recap, let's re reset here. Right. Uh, before we like have a fight about nothing or have a fight about the wrong thing right. or blow up at each other or stonewall each other or whatever. Like if you're trying to avoid right. going off the rails. And I, by the way, I think like a better, like my suggestion to that approach Please, yeah. would be like, as opposed to be like, do you rec do you realize like, you are coming off as rude is to flip that about like, this is where I would soften it and say like, so I just want to let you know, like that felt very aggressive to me or that felt very rude or yeah. that, how did that make you feel as opposed to like mm, you are being I statements. Yes. I feel like you're unjustifiably <laughs> criticizing me. Yeah. Or just like, Hey, yeah. that felt like a critique. I don't know if you meant it that way, uh -huh. but that felt like aggressive. And then like that would diffuse me. I'd be like, Oh, Hey, like, I realized that that was kind of critical or I didn't mean it that way or I'm really sorry. Hmm. It's like easier for someone to be able to then like apologize and reset as opposed to like you like almost saying like this is your character flaw, which it is, but like, <laughs> you know, like being able to say, hey, that, yeah, you know, so anyway. Well, yeah. So I mean, I think we're trying to strike a balance here. All of this like communication and conflict resolution advice, it often comes off real cheesy. Yeah. And especially when and they're like, art and disingenuous, yeah. and particularly when they're trying to like artificially tell you like, here's what you should do. Like that isn't the words <laughs> you're telling me to come out of my mouth do not correspond to the thoughts going on in my head. Right. So it feels fake. Yeah. But part of it, so you do have to take the step back and say, recognize that sometimes you jump into being in a confrontational step. Like it's premature. It's, it's not, right. it's not productive right. and it's not even like rational or justified. And so you do have to like, develop a, like an additional step in your thought process of when your first reaction is to be angry is really like re realizing yourself i'm not right like i'm going into a bad place right. before before i like let my hand off the wheel just let this happen and make sure i'm like what's going on here yeah and so i mean it, <clears throat> so yeah it's i think we're both in agreement it can come off fake and if you are just like robotically Right. regurgitating like I'm supposed to say this right but also for me like if I were the work. woman and you were like it sounds like it's important that we have protein in our kids diet I'd be like a yeah. few it's important like that feels yeah. like really like rude well it's like a, it's that's like that's like the boilerplate like re, like 
active listening and I'm reflecting right, back to you. Right. So I'm hearing, it sounds right. like you're saying sounds you like care about protein. Is, right. It's like, yeah, <laughs> so does any idiot that should be feeding their children. Yeah. But I have a solution. Go. I can't wait. I think we should teach people the glass jar method. No, <laughs> glass jar. <laughs> so it has not, we have not yet fully launched this because we've been doing a lot of inputting, but we haven't actually used yeah, it. I, but, I, I predict that we're going to sit right here and we're going to open it up. I love it. Open it up, yeah. But I think, so one of the things that we've been doing is like, and especially in that moment, right, where like the mom was calling home. So like, it's not like you have to then be in the space with this person. Yeah. But you're like, you know, you can express in that moment, like, look, like this kind of felt, I felt like you were like attacking me unjustly, or that really felt rude in the way that you asked that. Um, the, an approach that we've been taking, and I don't think it's always when we're like upset. Sometimes it's just like a, a situation that happens we want to recall, but yeah. we have these little slips of paper. Marcus uses them much more than I do, where you like write down like the situation or something that you want to trigger for a conversation later yeah. so that you have that conversation when it's not in the heat of the moment, when you're both like able to be reasonable. And that's when you're going to talk about, hey, so a, like a week ago when right. I was making dinner, like I made mac and cheese and whatever. And um, you mentioned that like you wanted to see more protein in the meal. So I want to talk to you a little bit about like what like what does an ideal dinner look like to you yeah, and right. and why? Because one of the things they talked about is like there may be a reason behind something that you may find out about your partner that you never knew. So like maybe your a partner like has a history of some kind of health issue and so like in their family. So they are trying to make sure like they have maybe even an irrational fear of like no. red meat or but again, fat like whether, in their diet. Whether it's rational or irrational, again, that's like something they're carrying around as a background context. Right. And so there's a dissonance because they're assuming that you do or should have that same context right. that they have. Right. Or and maybe so bringing right. that to the surface is going to help communication. Yeah. yeah. Or it might be like your partner grew up as a heavy kid and they are just so like hell bent on not letting your kid be, be bullied through something similar that they're like, you know, I want to make sure that they have, they eat a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruit and like we yeah. go very light on blah, blah, blah. But if your partner doesn't know that, or like maybe they grew up like poor. And the, so in the flip side is like, they want to have like a head, like a heavy meat mm -hmm. at every meal because that wasn't something they grew up with. And they feel like that's an important part of like building muscle and like making, and it represents having an abundance in your house. All of these things are things that we carry with us, but like you and I yeah. don't like talk about like, that's why I want the meal to be this way. And I think if you recognize why your partner is going in that direction, it's easier to either get on board or to talk about like, well, that makes sense. But let's now talk about like rationally. Yeah. Okay. So if, would it be okay if we did it four nights a week? We yeah. had this, but like sometimes we don't and it's, and it's still balanced and healthy or how can I offset on that day or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think like that is like, I think having those conversations, doing it not in that moment, but being able to explain, and this goes for all kinds of invisible work, right? It's like, why are you, is there a reason you're doing it that way and why? The flip side is, hey moms, you gotta let some stuff go. Like there is no rational reason that you would do laundry a certain way other than like, maybe it's like, well, I want the towels folded this way. Does it matter? Like, right. maybe it really does to you. Maybe the aesthetic of like your home and but like, you got to know where to give and to be like, if you want your partner to do and take on this thing, you have to let them do and take on this thing in its entirety. Yeah. And so just be, and that's harder, I think, for the mom, because we've typically been doing all of it. So we have established a way in which we do things because we've been doing it the whole time. And so um, I think just like, that I don't think that comes to light. I think people are putting a lot of fault, particularly on the dads, because usually it's the dads that haven't been doing the invisible work. And I feel like we gotta like, you gotta recognize that there's a give and take there. You don't get to dictate how everything in your home is done if you want someone else to take on how some things in your home are done. Um, I wanna say something. Yeah. Do, do you, give me a sense. Do you have like an outline and you're like, we're at point one of four? Or no, like, like this is the okay, end okay, of okay. Invisible Labor. And I, just, then I, I didn't want to like start like taking you down a tangent. No, no, no. Like, like I didn't want to kick off. Can I have some, well, since we're at this break. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like coffee break. <laughs> and we're back. We're back with Mornings with the Misses. Hello. I'm the Misses. <laughs> and 
I'm Mr. Homemaker. Okay. Um, so I, this whole visible work thing, mm -hmm. I want to devil's advocate it a little bit. Yeah. I don't want you to get mad at me. I'm probably going to get mad <laughs> about it. Go ahead. Well, I, cause I, I agree with every, like a lot of the, not everything. I agree with most of what you're saying. It, I, as I was just like went on a tangent about like the curse of knowledge and like it just creating this like, uh, this landscape rife with miscommunication and conflict, like needlessly, a lot of like what you're selling, calling like invisible work is the same as like, we're just failing to communicate our assumptions and expectations and context. Right. Um, I, there's just so many just different directions I want to go with this. Yeah. So, so I'm not going to be real articulate. You're going to have to okay. like help me think through it. I'm happy to. Before we do that, can I, I feel like I've yeah. been a little disingenuous on something and I just want to be Oh, good. Open. Confessions of a, yeah. of a breadwinner. This is not what I look like when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> I, I don't wear this sweater, but I have not done laundry in almost a full week and so all of the things that i would normally wear that would be camera appropriate in the morning are not available to me <laughs> so then once i put on the sweater i had to do my hair and that was it so like do you want to share why why our laundry system has been uh derailed temporarily warning so, warning to this all is a trigger trigger <laughs> warning to all laundry people Okay. Um, so the other day, um, we did laundry and when I started pulling everything out of the dryer, there was like all these like colorful spots on everything, which I first blamed on a dress that my mother-in-law sent to us because I thought like the ink had like come out of it. But what it really was, was one of our children had put three crayons in a pocket of their dress and then it went in the dryer and melted. And so, so I'm going to give you a few tips. One, always wash your children's clothing inside out because then all of the crayon marks are only on the inside of those clothing items. That was a big tip for me. The second thing is do small loans of laundry. Don't wash all of your children's clothing in one wash because then all of it gets crayon all over it. And the third thing, and this is not pointing the finger of blame at the person who did the dryer, but one safeguard that I always do is I never take the entire load and just shove it in the dryer. I take each item out and I shake it out because I actually just think it gets the wrinkles out better. And when you do that, usually the thing that is like left is at the bottom of the washing machine. Like I found like pennies and quarters, tissues, and I can catch those tissues when they're wet as opposed to putting them in the dryer and then like it goes all over all oh, of the you clothes. Think, you, think, <laughs> you think the crayons had come out of the pockets yeah. in oh, the yeah. washer? Yeah. Nine times out of ten. Like I, huh. I would be very surprised if they, because if they were, like if they so, stayed in there so within a wash, they probably would have. So you're saying the transfer from the washer to the dryer is a second chance to catch. It's like a second catch, safeguard. To catch all this, this yeah. stuff. Oh, well, not, no, not only that, but because I <laughs> shake things out, I would have like, it, it would have fallen out or it felt like, why does this, like, what did that, hmm. what was that feel? So hmm. I'm not blaming you because I put things in the washer and I didn't check all the pockets. I check our pockets, but I never yeah. check our kids' pockets. I'm like, what are they, like, they got nothing. They're like a rock. <laughs> uh, oh, or you took them out on a or date a to a restaurant and they have three little crayons in that mm. dress pocket so it was so we've got so we're behind on laundry yeah and also we we need money to buy <laughs> all new wardrobe <laughs> but we got lots of play clothes that's really nice play <laughs> that's clothes. right they're gonna be the cutest kids at the playground okay um so here's my concern with this this whole yes RPG invisible work wants to know <laughs> this whole invisible work issue mm -hmm. And this could apply to a lot of other marriage and gender role controversies or mm -hmm. like, you know, sort of themes that recur. Yeah. Is I don't know how to bring it up in such a way that men aren't immediately going to like ignore, like be like resentful. Right. Because it basically comes off as, hey, it used to be you weren't doing this and now you're doing this and I'm still irritated with you. It's like, cool, I'm done trying. Like you're inviting men to be like, this, you're proving my point. Right. You're never satisfied but no matter what hear, I do. Right. Don't yeah. you hear my whole thing? Was that like, no, no, no. hey, moms. I mean, but, no, but like, 
that you, a guy had to listen to, to 20 minutes to get to that part. But even like the other stuff we were listening, like the other podcast you're referring to, it doesn't come off that way at all. Like you're being much more like even handed about it. I think all the stuff I've read and heard is just much more like, oh, men are screw ups again. Right. Like women, you, you know how it is. Like you, right. you can't get these men right. to do anything right. It's right. like, geez, right. like why would I even bother? Right. So, so you can put, you should put a position that says, hey, men. Well, I wouldn't come Want to yeah. cut your wife off at the knees and not let her argue with you? <laughs> That's Take terrible. on a task. That is a terrible, no, because now, <laughs> now you're like saying, you're like, you're like saying like, you know what the best revenge is? Kill them with kindness. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't like that message because even if you're trying to get people to be kind, the idea that you're trying to motivate them through vengeance. Yeah. I don't think that's healthy. <laughs> Similarly, but somebody's got to take the first step. So just you yeah. gotta, you know, as the guy so listen my, to this with an open mind, and no, I'm like, no. my, so my answer to this is all is again like the 180 degree solution. My solution to this is not, hey men, like you're like um, exacting, overly critical supervisor at work. Um, you should just try really hard, and eventually they'll be nice to you. Like that's what it sounds like you're saying. Like, oh, I know, I know your boss at work is like really mean and just like unreasonable and just like constantly berates you. But if you just try really, really hard, maybe one day he'll stop berating you. Yeah. But you're just saying instead of at work, your supervisor, you're saying your wife. It's like so. This is condescending on multiple dimensions. There's no, nothing about. I'm like, I want a new job. Um, I would like be like, dust off that resume. Let's see if it doesn't transfer over to my like never divorce philosophy. Yeah. So my solution to this is the 180 degree solution, which is like, hey, man, you're responsible for everything that happens in your house, including the di- like feeding your kids and grocery shopping and doing laundry. If your wife is taking on some of those things and you, you have no involvement, then you're failing to fulfill your responsibility to ensure that your entire household is well, operating well. But it's a you're responsible for everything mentality, not you should keep trying harder and harder and harder. And maybe that boss one day will stop being, being mean to you. Yeah. Men, speaking on behalf of all men, because we're all a monolith, and I speak on behalf of us, mm-hmm. men don't re- react well to, like, being strung along, like, like a carrot <clears throat> on the end of a stick. Like, right. I know that before I said you weren't doing enough, and then you did more, but now I'm saying that you're still not doing enough. And they're like, done. I am yeah. over this. Yeah. So, it's just, like, a messaging problem. Yeah. Now, to use some, like, really divisive and, like, inappropriate language that I don't typically associate with, but mm-hmm. I'm trying to represent some of the men in my constituency, like, I am sure that there are some betas out there who are, like, perfectly happy to, like, follow around their wives, like, doting little, like, entry-level mm-hmm. employees at a at a fast food restaurant and be like, hey, whatever you say, boss. Like, I'm happy to flip the fries however you want. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a bright-eyed little buddy. Yeah. Here here to be your the caddy to your golf tournament. Um but like those are my minority of guys. Yeah. So like this messaging that I'm hearing a lot <clears> of <throat> in podcasts and seeing in a lot of articles, written by a lot of like ultra lib women in journalism, some portion of men out there are like self hating enough feminists that they will get on board with that. But for the other eighty percent of men, they're gonna be like, This is exactly why I don't bother because no matter what you do, you're ne- is never enough. So again, like I'm, I agree with you in the uh, objective. Right. I think this entire, like everything women are saying to each other and to their husbands about this is part of the problem. Do you think there could be something to that? Or do you think this is, I'm, I am not speaking for men. This is just me and all the other men in the world are like, no, 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 Marcus, all the other men, we've all been talking. <laughs> to you have been talking to all the other men and they're like no no we all agree with you Kristen Marcus is just way out on his own I mean that would make sense <laughs> no I'm always like I'm just always overwhelmed and it's like taken aback when your like aggressive side comes out and not to say it doesn't like it comes out a lot but it's like it is it is like oh okay well let me I feel like <laughs> we're about to fight so <laughs> um let me step back um, I mean, no, like, I think that's, I think that's fair. I think, um, I would edit that and say, like, as we've talked about, like, you're supposed to be coming at this as a partnership. And so, like, 
the reality is like, I understand your swing because women have been in charge. Like it's, it's interesting to hear you say like, as a man, you should be in charge of the operations of your household. That's like not- I didn't say in charge. I said you have a responsibility to ensure that everything is being developed. This is the extreme ownership book. Yeah. The extreme ownership by- Jocko. Jocko Willink. His whole thing is, and we haven't talked about him for a while, so let me just give the 30 second yeah. spiel. Jocko is a former U.S. Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. and he talks about, in his book, Extreme Ownership, right. the concept of leadership. And he's talking about it from a, like, I'm a former military person who now I'm a professional like business consultant. Yeah. And this particularly exec like all do. executive coach. Yeah. And so he tries to convey to people who have less experience in management and leadership but like often find themselves thrust into like senior executive positions because mm -hmm. like they have the degree or they have whatever right and so he tries to help them like fast track their like development of their leadership skills mm -hmm. and his like central concept is that what makes special forces the special operations community to include navy seals mm -hmm successful is that they have a culture of extreme ownership yeah. where everyone takes and particularly people in informal positions of authority but really everybody has a mentality of it is my job to make sure that everything within my like sphere of influence yeah. everything under my purview it is my job to make sure that all of this succeeds mm -hmm. and it's not this is my job and that's your job right and if i see that you're struggling with your job like that's your problem dude how does that how does he how does he um marry that with but without being a micromanager because like that's a real i love yeah. that like right like because it, it, yeah. like it's like you can take it in a like really kind of aggressive way of like i am in charge of all like my job is to make sure everything works yeah. or you could also i mean but i also love the concept of like it's like i yeah. like it's like the care of your people right it's like my job to make sure like everybody's moving in the same direction but we're all doing well and we're all, like, well, so, yeah, like that be, but yeah, what so, is so, so like we're gonna get into some like get into that so there's a few intersecting like concepts in military leadership doctrine but so the, the ethos here is extreme ownership. I'm responsible for everything. Yeah. That I, anything I can influence, I must influence. Yeah. Anything that I can, like I am in a position to contribute to, I must contribute to it. Okay. But you're talking about an intersecting concept of what they call like mission command, which is like the military's doctrinal version of like, um, well, like you could, there's a lot of concepts like this in philosophy and political theory about like subsidiarity and federalism and like basically things should be handled at the lowest possible level. So if I see that some, like somebody on my team is performing some task and they can handle it, I'm not going to step in and tell them do it my way because mm -hmm. the way they're doing it is handling it. They are accomplishing the job. Mm -hmm. So I have to exercise self-restraint. It's different than if they are doing it in such a way that it's not going to meet the standard, then I am obligated to step in. Right. Because if you are a reluctant leader who lets somebody struggle, then you are doing a disservice to everybody else on the team. Right. Because they are dependent on that person doing their job well. And if you're like, ah, but I don't want to make them feel bad, mm -hmm. then what you're doing implicitly is all, all of you can suffer a little bit because right. I don't want to deal with the emotional discomfort of right. confronting this person about their, you know, failure. So, but, so the default is to, for higher headquarters or higher up the chain of command to, to exercise a default of restraint and empowering mm -hmm. the, sub, the lower level person to exercise their own judgment to only intervene when necessary. Okay. Um, and then there's sort of a third thing that you made me think of, but maybe the, so his book isn't meant to like, it doesn't go deep down that like mm -hmm. leadership styles and like organizational design and echelons of delegation. Um, it alludes to it sort of along the way, but what he's really trying to drive home is he's trying to get people to abandon the 50, 50 mindset. Right. To draw it back to like marriage parallels of saying, most people, particularly in corporate America, have a like, I have a job, mm -hmm. I'm looking out for me, I do my job in such a way that I stand out. And if I see that you're struggling with your job, well, like, that's your problem, and actually, maybe that's good for me. Right. And he's like, you got to turn all that on its head. Everybody needs to have a mindset of, like, I'm going all in on making sure we as a team are successful. Right. And that means I have to, like, know enough and be involved enough and stepping up enough to support people who are struggling. Um so yeah. like bringing that to a marriage though, how, and the reason I asked about the micromanaging is like, how do you, so one, 
Can both people have an extreme ownership mindset? Does that work together? I think that's the 100-100 answer. Okay. I mean, I don't think we've, like, done the long math on that. But, yeah, I think, like, basically the concept of a 80-80 marriage or 100-100 marriage is that you can have more than one person who has that mindset. Okay. I think it gets easier to do that when you do have some kind of role clarity. Right. If you have no role clarity in two people who are, like, all in on right. extreme ownership, I honestly think that's not a bad thing, but it just means that you're going to have to over the court, over, you're going to have to iteratively solve the, like, which of us is on first. Right. Because even in extreme ownership, if you're the, like, team lead or the executive or whatever, again, like, you have to... There's a difference between I have purview over everything versus I'm actively micromanaging everything. Those are two different questions. And so if I'm the cook in the house, just to change yeah. it up, like, then you need to be invested enough in my success that you are aware and understand and, like, are able to support. Right. But not interfering unless right. there, you see some need to interfere. Right. And it can't just be like, well, I would do it differently. Right. But if we have no clarity on like, well, who's on first, then right. both of us are both trying to be the person and support the, like, like, unless you have some like hive mind, right. you're little, you're just going to be paralyzed by indecisiveness because it's not at all clear, like what the play is, who's in yeah. what position. I think <clears throat> if I were to, because one of the things you've asked me before is like, if you were to give advice to someone just starting out, right. In marriage, yeah. I think this is one of those places that could really help to like, uh, like rocket your marriage to success and like get you ahead of the crowd, which is um, I, like talking about this like extreme ownership model and these um, like the, the kind of how you're going to split up the duties, but also taking the time then to understand how the other one does something. Yeah. Because one, it's easier to do it when you're just too two married people with no children and no other responsibility to say like, well, like, let's talk about like how let's like, let me see how you do meal planning and whatever. It's like, like a fun little like date yeah, experiment right, of right. like, let's like because do this thing together. <laughs> right. Cause you're not stressed about it. But also yeah. then you're coming into being parents with a, with a baseline of hey, this is how our household operates. These are the things that you're going to really kind of take on, but I know how to do them. If you yeah. were to disappear, like, you know, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. I want to, yes, and do that. One of the things I want to flag along this line of invisible work is I do think one of the pitfalls couples fall into, particularly men, this is a failure of extreme ownership, is men fail to recognize that the moment their wife is pregnant, she starts to accumulate new invisible work. Right. And so even if up to the point of your wife is now pregnant, you guys are on the same page and working Symbi simpatico. Yeah. The moment she becomes pregnant. I'm sorry. Is every yeah. is everything okay? Yeah. And we're back. Okay, so our kids woke up 15 minutes early. We had to scramble and start our morning routine. And so now I just wanted to, before we like tear down the equipment and go on with our day, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that we just sort of like at least identified and put a pin in a few threads of this conversation so we don't lose them we can pick them up next time i don't think we'll resolve this right now but okay. i just want to make sure we at least have a preliminary like these are the next relevant steps <clears throat> so we we're talking about rather than a um a paradigm or a dynamic or a conversation between husbands and wives where men are like trying like pursuing the approval of their wives i think that that dynamic will not does not land well with men <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> I would like you to wait patiently until mommy and daddy tell you that we're done. <clears throat> so I was contrasting that with like the extreme ownership model of like, rather than it being about like, you're trying to pursue approval and the tasks that have been delegated to you, which comes off super condescending. It's the same like, a more empowering mentality of like you have responsibility for all the things that take place in your household. And so you need to proactively, you know, get smart and exercise initiative and make sure things are getting done. And one thing I wanted to say about that is as you started to allude to, like, or ask, is that compatible with more than one person having that mentality or whatever? And part of my answer is you need role clarity, which is not the same thing as having stovepipes, but he's trying to break you out of his stovepipes. Like, this is my lane. I don't worry about your lane. 
Right. You worry about you, I worry about me. Say, right. That's the wrong mentality. You need to have a, a shared vision of a co cohesive whole. Right. But you also do need to know, like, I'm the quarterback or I'm the tight end. I know what my job is. Right. But I also know how to support you in doing your job. Yeah. So those two things are not mutually exclusive, but people, like, pit them against each other and then pick an extreme mm -hmm. of either I'm a micromanager or I'm a stovepiper. Right. And those are both wrong. <clears throat> but the other thing I just want to make a footnote. I often hesitate to use military metaphors because among the vast majority of the population who does not have real life military experience or even like exposure to like the military culture, the, the cliche stereotype is that the military is a place where it's just like drill sergeants right. in boot camp, like Right. Calling you a worm. It's and like, like the entry. That's the entry yeah. level. That's to like, get everybody on the same page. Well, it's, it's the it's the like break you down. And right. It's, and in a sense, it's. I mean, they would call, they wouldn't say it this way, but you can think of it like a hazing process right. too. It's like you're trying to weed out the weak. Mm -hmm. You're trying to break people down. Mm -hmm. and you're trying to like so that you can reprogram them mm -hmm. under the, like, hey, we all need to be on the same page about how this is going to work. You're all coming to this from different vantage points. Right. We're gonna we're gonna disabuse you of your yeah. whatever your vantage point is so you can start developing a new coherent vantage point yeah in any case like all of the hollywood movies about which are like disproportionately about like boot camp right or combat right. like 99.5 percent of the military for 99.5 percent of people in the military that is not the experience right. that is not the culture that's not how right. things work so i always hesitate a little bit but particularly in like the special forces community where special operations community where I always get his name wrong. Willink. Jocko. Jocko. Where he's from, they are known for being particularly egalitarian, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing as like there, it, there is a rank structure. There right. is authority, right. but there is also like that authority is wielded very lightly. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of leadership by consensus building and empowering subordinates. And so it's not a matter of like, I'm importing some like, because I can just feel like the, the, the hair going up on the backs of all the like anti-patriarchy yeah. folks out there of like, oh, see, he's trying to like use some military framework to justify the patriarchy. Like that is, that stereotype and accusation is wrong on several le levels. Right. Um... And then where we left off before our children rudely interrupted us is <laughs> I was saying that I think one of the big vulnerabilities is men who fail to appreciate once their wife is pregnant, the amount of invisible work she accumulates. Right. And so even if you have a, even if you have the appearance or even if you really do achieve like, Hey, we're married and we're living together and like, we're on the same page about who's doing what. And like, yeah. we think this is an equitable arrangement of housework and invisible work and whatever wherever you think you are on that no matter how like comfortable you are i think i think we were comfortable but then like after the fact we we're like oh this wasn't actually a good arrangement but like we just kind of fell into habits yeah. but we would not i think have said like oh yeah like we we're having a lot of friction over our household prior to kids in any case one of the things that i've tried to like really hit hard in my like welcome to fatherhood stuff is Part of the welcome to fatherhood and why it's a good segue into discussing marriage issues is as soon as your wife says, I'm pregnant, like that begins a series of dominoes falling of like, now we got to start worrying about things like, I mean, beyond she's pregnant, like the physiological aspects of that. But it's also like, well, we got to start thinking about a nursery. We got to start thinking about childcare. We got to start thinking about all of these other things that Part, and I, again, I blame sort of the industry for being written, produced by women for women and leaving the men out of it. So there's a lot of conversations going on among women about what needs to be done once you're pregnant. Right. And men are not necessarily involved in that conversation. Right. And then like you were saying about cooking and laundry, there's just like, well, why doesn't he just know what to do? Like, there's no way that he would know what to do. Right. He, you, he has been systematically excluded from the conversation about knowing what to do. Right. And so I think that is the, like a critical moment for a man to realize part of extreme ownership, part of like the hundred hundred, part of all of this is saying, my wife's pregnant and I have a responsibility to make sure that all of this is functioning well right. and that we as a family unit are moving in the right direction. Yeah.
So there's a lot of me monologuing. I'm going to have to give you more chance to react to it. But what are your what are your concluding thoughts as we as we adjourn this morning with the misses? I think I return to my message of always like give yourself grace, give your partner grace, assume positive intent as you are going through this, but recognize that like there are like the invisible work is exactly that. It is invisible. And so you also can't expect your partner just knows the things that are going on. So it's about maintaining open communication and being frank and honest about the things that are that are stressing you and talk about ways that you can work together. And I think like bottom line is like one of the most important things about this extreme ownership like pr perspective is that um, like it also appeals to people who are like who believe in resilience, right? Like, yeah. do you want a resilient household? What happens if like one day I get sent away for work for a month or, or something COVID. I get sick or yeah. right or whatever it may be or something worse or more long term than that? Um, I think that you know knowing being able to like jump right in and know kind of how the things work to keep things moving steady and to make your kids in a time of uncertainty feel that their routines and systems are still going on is critically important. I think a lot of people don't realize that until it's an emergency or um, it's a, a little too late. And so, you know, take the time early on to kind of work through those things um, and make sure that you're just being like thoughtful and kind to one another, uh, you know, every day as you approach it. Okay, so we were going to do a heavy Reddit, but I'm going to save it for our next morning with the missus. Thank you. I love you. Love you too. I feel like you should do the sign because it's morning with the missus. You need to come up with a signature thing. Yeah, I haven't. I don't have one yet, but um, yeah, you've been with morning with the missus. I hope you get an extra cup of coffee this morning, and we'll see you tomorrow. Awesome.